All right, I want to do a study today on the transgender movement, the transvestite movement, whatever you want to say there, in light of what the King James Bible teaches about it. Uh, right now there's uh, some fakers out there, uh, specifically Steven Anderson and Roger Jimenez, that have made this uh, comments about this shooting down at this gay nightclub in Florida, Orlando, Florida, uh, where 50 people lost their lives. And these guys are coming out, and, and just like Fred Phelps from the Westboro Baptist cult, uh, they're coming out and they're making these radical statements about how that there should have been more that died or were glad that they died and stuff. But what does the Bible actually teach about this issue? All right. Um, we're going to look at those scriptures today. And I'm going to show you that Stephen Anderson and Roger Jimenez and any of their ilk, there's a whole cult following there. There's a bunch of them uh, that have these same church building things. But uh, I'm going to show you that they don't line up with scripture. Okay, I'm going to show you what the Bible actually teaches about this movement. Um, so just say that right up front. And by the way, if you are a, a homosexual, that's not the Bible term. The Bible term is sodomite. Uh, I will be using that term because it's a scriptural term in, in terms of that's what they're described as. Uh, if you are that, I'm going to tell you right now, the Bible is against what you're doing. But the Bible nowhere gives any kind of ground today to kill people of your particular persuasion. Now, if you say, well, this is wrong, this is hate speech, so you're going to censor me because I follow what the scriptures say. You see? Uh, isn't that kind of being intolerant? I mean, if you are a, what the modern world calls homosexual or transgender, transvestite, whatever, uh, it would do you well to actually pick up a King James Bible or just look it up online. There are lots, lots of uh, online King James Bibles. Look it up. Look at the scriptures I'm presenting in this study today. Don't just charge me with hate speech, okay? I'm not advocating violence. But let's start out here. We're going to start out in Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verse 5. What does God think about a man wearing women's clothing or a woman wearing men's clothing? Let's look about that. It says here, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. End of argument. Okay? Um, and you say, well, yeah, but that's Old Testament. Okay, show me in the New Testament where this has been undone. You see, the way you properly divide the scriptures is you look and you see, hey, right here, something in the Old Testament, and is it undone or is it still there and still in effect in the New Testament? All right? And where you have problems is with this Anderson cult and his followers, they don't rightly divide the scriptures. They'll go through and they'll pick things out under the law, after the law, you know, before the law. They just take the whole Bible and say, I'm just going to pick out what I want. You can't do that as a Bible-believing Christian. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You must rightly divide the word of truth. Obviously, there was animal sacrifices back in the Old Testament. We don't have them today. They were building a nation, the nation of Israel, back in the Old Testament. We're not building a nation today. Okay? You have to rightly divide the word of truth. But I want to show you something interesting here. It says... The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, not belongs to a man. You know, we were talking about this, my wife and I, and I said, you know, if you grab one of my flannel shirts and put the thing on because you're cold, well, it, belong, it belongs to me, but it's not the same thing as you walking around all the time dressing like me. Things that pertain to a man. Things that you see somebody out in public, you see them far off and you go, oh, that right there looks like a man. It pertains to a man. All right? Women are not supposed to wear, according to Scripture, according to the King James Bible, not my beliefs, not my opinions, right there. It says it plain as day. Women are not supposed to wear things that, are, that pertain to a man, and uh, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Okay? It's crystal clear. But let me show you something interesting. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 30. Same chapter, just go over to verse 30. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. It was a, talking about a short skirt that they would have worn underneath their clothing. They're kind of like modern day underwear. So you're not to be looking at that and things. You're not even supposed to look at that. All right. Interesting. Because in the Old Testament, men wore skirts. They didn't wear pants. And isn't it interesting that on our modern world... You know, we, you know, people get all upset about the transgender thing and stuff like that because they think mostly of men dressing like women. 
why don't they get upset about women dressing like men? Oh, because women have been dressing like men for nearly a hundred years now. Women do wear pants. They do wear things that look like men. But isn't, isn't it ironic that if you go back to the early 1900s and on back through, women would have always worn very long dresses down to their feet most of the time. Very, very, very long dresses. You can't even see their ankles. But what did it transition to? It transitioned from dresses to skirts and then to pants. Hmm. You hit up into the 1940s and 50s, they, women start to wear skirts. The length of the dress starts to come up. And by the time you get into the 60s and 70s, they got the mini skirts on. And then they just pretty much transition totally to pants now. Very few women even wear dresses or skirts. And if they do, they're almost always immodest. Interesting. We are very far away from what God intended in his word. And you say, well, I don't appreciate this. I don't, I don't, I don't think that this is right. These mid-Victorian pruder... It's what the Bible says. Are you going to take away my right to preach this book? You say, well, you're causing hate. How am I causing hate? Have I advocated violence yet? Have I done anything to say, hey, people that do this stuff should be killed? No. And by the way, does the verse advocate any kind of violence right there? Chapter 22, verse 5 in Deuteronomy, did it say anything about killing them? Putting them to death? No. No, it didn't. Let's go to the New Testament now. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look here and we're going to see what the New Testament has to say about this distinction between men and women. God loves, you know, they, they have this uh, modern day term, diversity. Uh, and what that means is that you put up with other people's sins. That's not what God wants. God loves differences. He loves diversity, true diversity. And he wants to preserve that diversity. You're going to see that over and over again in the Bible. But let's look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15. It says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. There's supposed to be distinction. God even looks, not, it's not even just about clothes. God even looks at the length of a man's hair. And he says, it's given him for a covering. If it's covering your forehead, what, down like that and things, it's covering. If it's covering your ears, down over. If it covers way down onto your back, you know, there, it's a woman's hair. Okay, I'll show you another verse that ties into this. Revelation, the book of Revelation. You know, these uh, transgender people, when they're, they're growing their hair, these men are growing their hair really long so that they can look like women. God looks at that and he says, that's a shame. Revelation chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. This is in the time of Jacob's trouble in the future, uh, this coming time period. And there are lots of plagues that are happening that God sends to punish the wicked world. And look at this one. This is interesting. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7 says, And the shapes of the locust, locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Wait a second. They had men's faces, but women's hair. So God doesn't care about the length of your hair if you're a man. Yes, he does. He said so right there in his word. You say, well, I don't appreciate this. Okay, then you have a problem with this book. All right? I mean, what, is the, what do the verses say that we've gone over so far? You see? And believe me, I'm not your enemy. If you are a transgender, transvestite, uh, sodomite, whatever else, LGBT, whatever you want to call yourself, if you're one of those, just read the book. All right? And see, God has a wonderful plan for you if you're willing to repent. I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. God did not create you to be the way that you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, one of the things that uh, these devil-worshipping people like uh, Stephen Anderson uh, will tell you is salvation is just belief. Uh, there's a lot of these people out there that call themselves King James Bible, Bible believers. They're not. If they don't teach repentance, having a part of 
your salvation, uh, then they're not saved. Just as simple as that. They're false prophets. They're liars. And they are trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is faith toward, or repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And there's a whole lot more to it there. We, you know, not going to get into it right now. But the point is, you will see a changed life. Let me show you. you know, and let me just say this before I continue. Stephen Anderson and his ilk, these false prophets, uh, Jack Hiles was, was one of them, Jack Scapp, the guy that was fornicating with a minor girl, and, and uh, Jack Hiles, uh, he was um, committing adultery with his deacon's wife. So, I mean, these, they're sex perverts. And it's funny because they, as sex perverts, will go after other people that they call sex perverts. Kind of weird, isn't it? But they'll tell you, all you got to do to be saved is just believe. Just believe Jesus died for your sins, boom, you're in. And you say, okay, so all somebody who is involved in sexual perversion, like sodomy or transgenderism or whatever, you say all they got to do is just believe to be saved, right? No, they can't be saved. That's what Stephen Anderson teaches and his little group there. They teach that. Sodomite, people involved in sodomy, cannot be saved. I'm going to show you the verses that disprove that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is two things in your New Testament. First of all, it's, it's similar to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven being an earthly, physical kingdom. I've done studies on that. So we can't get into the whole all the scriptures on it. Only the book of Matthew has the term kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the millennial kingdom. If you want to get right down to it. That's coming. The thousand years of peace. Again, very big study. Um, you know, if you're just watching this and you're transgender, you don't know anything about this, that's fine. You can study that stuff later. Kingdom of God can refer to the physical kingdom that's coming one day. But it also can refer to the kingdom of God being the spiritual fellowship between somebody who's saved and God the Father. Okay. And uh, this passage here, particularly, it's talking about salvation. Okay. It's not just talking about fellowship between a Christian and um, God. I'm going to show you that. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you. Notice the list of things there, effeminates, one of them, and abusers of themselves with mankind, you know, fornicators, the first thing, idolaters, adulterers. Fornication is, is sex outside of marriage. So you get that one put on the, if you're LGBTQ, whatever, you get that when you're a fornicator, you're not married. And if you say, well, I got a little pa piece of paper here from the state because my state recognizes gay marriage or whatever else, show me a, a state marriage license in the Bible. It's not in there, okay? Um, it's not a marriage that is approved by God. The state comes along and says, here's a little piece of paper saying you paid us a certain amount and we give you the official permission to be married. That doesn't mean anything in God's sight. That's not a biblical marriage. And uh, we advise people regularly that they should not have state marriage licenses between a husband and a wife, too, by the way, man and woman. So another story again. But uh, effeminate, what's effeminate? Somebody who's effeminate. Can a woman be effeminate? She's supposed to be feminine. So what's it talking about here? It's talking about a man that acts like a woman. Remember what we read earlier about a man's not to wear that which pertains to a woman, or he's not to put on a woman's garment, excuse me. Why? It's feminine. Women wear more feminine clothes than men do. How about the thing of a man's not supposed to have long hair like a woman? Why? Because it's effeminate. If you're doing those things, I mean, it's it's clearly just spelled right out there. You're not supposed to do those things. But notice there in verse 11, in, and such were some of you. They can get saved. But ye are washed, washed in the blood of the Lamb. His, his blood that he shed on the cross washes your sins away. But ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. See, when you truly get saved... You will have a profession of faith, but you will also have the Holy Spirit bearing witness. You will have a new life. You'll have a changed life. And that's the wonderful thing. That's the good news for you if you're part of this perverted group of people. It doesn't say, such were some of you, but we killed those that wouldn't convert, forcibly converted them or something like this. It doesn't say that. 
you're not going to find any teaching in your New Testament saying that we should be putting Sodomite people to death. You're not going to find it. All right? Let's continue. Because I know people are going, well, I can prove one. Well, let's go there. Because I know what you're thinking. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. We'll start there. It says here, Because what, that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Like a lot of people are going to be doing when they hear this sermon. Oh, you're just reading out of an old book there, and that's, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's God's Word. You Are you wise enough to correct it? I don't think so. Verse 23, And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You know when you are into sodomy of any kind? Uh, when, you, when you are a man and you dress like a woman, or when you're a woman and you dress like a man, you're actually dishonoring your own body. You know, and, I, and just let me just speak to you for a minute here, if you're involved in this movement. Because I understand, I was involved in the sex perversion of pornography back before I got saved. I understand. You get lonely and you, and you have needs and things like this, and, and it turns into perversion, and you think... Well, I, I need to just do a little bit more and I'll just do this and I'll do that and maybe that'll make sense. And, and you get rejected by this person, rejected by that person and everything else. And, and pretty soon you start doing more and more bizarre types of things to get the thrill, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what's happening? You're being turned over to a reprobate mind. And when you stop caring, when you stop thinking about God, when you stop saying, I wonder what God thinks of what I'm doing. When you start to push God out of the equation, you know what? You're being turned over to a reprobate mind. Don't do that. What you want to do is you want to say, what does God want from me? What does this book say? Not what does some foul-mouthed little preacher down in Tempe, Arizona, or over in California, wherever his little cult building is. Not what do they say. What does the book say? What does this Bible say? That's what you want to find out. That's why I advocate a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not through a church building someplace. Not through organized religion. Personal relationship. He died for your sins. He wants to save you. He wants to help you get those sins cleaned up. And that's the dangerous part of this easy believism gospel because they tell you, you don't have to clean up your sins. You don't have to have a changed life. You can just continue on. But you know what? If you have been around long enough with this perversion stuff, you want to change life. Don't you? Mm -hmm. You're not happy. There's no joy. There's no happiness in that. There's no real fulfillment. But let's continue. Verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. forever. Amen. Excuse me. Notice that. They changed the truth of God into a lie. So you don't believe this book. You know, there's people out there that say, oh, that old Bible, that, all that, you know, and that, whatever. What are they doing? Changing the truth of God into a lie. Yeah. But look at verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. A lot of the uh, sexually transmitted diseases are a result of perversion of sodomy. Whatever flavor of sodomy you want to pick. That's what's going on there. And you'll never find happiness or contentment in that sex perversion movement. You'll never find it. <clears throat> verse 28 look at this one and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient hmm. being filled with all unrighteousness fornication, wickedness, covetousness maliciousness, full of envy murder, debate, deceit malignity, whispers murder hmm. turns out that this uh, Muslim guy that went and did this shooting down in Orlando turned out that he himself was a sodomite. What happened? 
he was turned over to a reprobate mind. Mm -hmm. He was involved in the same sins that he went and executed these people for. See, you'll get bitter about this sin that you struggle with and you'll lash out at other people. You'll judge them because you yourself are struggling with the same thing. And I find it ironic that Stephen Anderson can come out and he can judge the Sodomites while he himself is yoked up to a man, Paul Wittenberger, who, made, who worked on a Sodomite film. I'm going to post the, the link to that video down in the description box showing you the proof. Paul Wittenberger, Steven Anderson's film producer, works for Hollywood. I worked on the film crew for, uh, I think it was like in sound or something like that, for a lesbian film. And Steven Anderson invites the guy into his home, done videos with him and stuff like this. They're good friends. See what the problem is? Hypocrisy. Just like this Muslim that went down there and murdered these people. Goes down there and kills them and he himself is guilty of the same sins. Isn't that something? You'll see that with organized religion a lot. You know why? Because there's been no true repentance in their life. They are professing to be saved while continuing in those sins. And just kind of keeping it covered. And Let's not talk about that. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Why do you think these people, these easy believism people, why do you think they scour the pages of the New Testament looking everywhere they can to try and find people that are involved in sin and yet still saved? Why do you think that, that is? What possible motivation do you think that there could be for that? Hmm. I'll let you answer that question. Verse 30. Backbiters. Haters of God. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Hmm. How many people are guilty of that one? They condemn sodomy and yet they'll turn right around and watch it as entertainment. Well, I'm not doing it but I'm watching somebody else, okay, then you're guilty. You're guilty of it. But you see, it says there, they're worthy of death. They which commit such things are worthy of death. You say, well, see, sodomites should be put to death according to the New Testament. Okay, then you also have to kill people that uh, debate, people that have deceit, malignity, whisperers. How about that one? You're going to ex execute everybody that's a whisperer? You see, these people, these ministers of hate, like the Fred Phelps Westboro Baptist Church, Stephen Anderson, Roger Jimenez, all these guys, these little, this, their little group, their little circle, you know, these people are hypocrites. They'll go throughout the Bible and they'll pick out stuff that they want, but they will not rightly divide the word of truth. They will not look and they will not say, okay, well, you know, it's saying that they're worthy of death, but it doesn't say that they should die, all right? Hey, we're all worthy of death. If you get right down to it. It's really something. But you see, why they're doing this whole thing, the reason that Stephen Anderson and his little following, the reason that they're doing this is to get you to hate people like me. See, Anderson's not one of us. He's not a Bible-believing Christian. He's not a preacher. He's not even saved. But he wants to turn you against those of us that do believe the book and come to you in love and say, hey, I understand you're going through some things right now. Come to Jesus Christ as a sinner. Come to Jesus Christ and he, he died on the cross to pay for your sins. Yes, what you're doing is wicked. Yes, what you are doing is an abomination in God's sight. But then again, another portion of Scripture, I think it's back in the book of Proverbs, says lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. Lying lips. So you see... Dressing a man dressing like a woman and a woman dressing like a man, it's an abomination in God's sight, but so is lying. You say, what a condemnation, what a, what, a, what a condemning God, what a hateful God. No, 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 no. No, see, you don't understand. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He said, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All you got to do is just come to him in a broken state and say, God, I'm a sinner. I don't want to continue in this. I want a new life. Please save me. See? 
Your sins is what should point you to Jesus Christ as the solution for your sins so that you can go to heaven when you die. That's the whole point. It's not, I have to be this ultra-righteous, wonderful person that never makes mistakes and just keeps my sinful life just kind of the skeletons in the closet, you know what I mean? No, 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 no. You come to God in honesty, in sincerity, and you say, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. I know what your book says. I understand this Bible. And I know that this Bible condemns me. And I'm crying out for mercy. Please save me. That's how the thing works. Romans chapter 2, verse 16 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Are you ready to have your secrets judged? I mean, we're not talking about the things that you've done and other people know about. How about your secrets? Those secret things, those times that you've looked at certain things and thought some things that you don't even want to mention. Someday you're going to have to give an account for those. God knows your thoughts. And you're going to be judged for your secrets. Unless, unless you get saved. I mean, think about this. You say, well, now I'm going to have to do this, this thing. What is salvation? Salvation is a new life. It's like, you know, you play in a game or something like that and you just do horrible. And you look down and you say, you know what? I'm just going to push the reset button. Now I'm going to start over. Well, sometimes you wish you could do that for your life. But guess what? This book says you can. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You have a reset button for your life. And that reset button is faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, in His shed blood on the cross to pay for your sins. You push it, you reset it, and God will help you have a new life. The Holy Spirit will come into your life and He'll change things. And He'll give you a blessed, wonderful life and a guarantee of eternity in heaven when you die, not in the fires of hell. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 says here, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. What inspires me to do this study is not, I'm not warning the sodomites out there, the LGBTQ thing. I'm not warning you people and saying, um, if, you don't, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to get the biggest guns and the whatever else, and I'm going to come to where you are. I'm going to kill as many of you. No, 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 no. I know the terror of the Lord. I know that God, our creator, the creator of man, men and women, you know, mankind, I'm saying, he wrote a book and he has some very specific rules in here. And I'm saved. I'm a preacher. I'm a minister of this book of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know someday that you're going to stand before God. I took the way out. The way out is Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. All right, I put my faith in that and came to Him and said, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. And He saved me. And I know what God's going to do to people who reject. You say, well, then that's hate speech. That's terrorism. No, 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 no. no. Because I'm not doing anything. You see? All I'm doing is warning you about what God the Father is going to do. Now, you, if you're an atheist, well, you just say, I don't believe in God. Okay, fine. Go on about doing your business. Right? Whatever. But if you say, I do believe that this world had to have been created. I do believe that there has to be a God out there somewhere. I, don't, I just don't know Him. I don't know what He says. I don't know what he, what he teaches about different things. If I did, that would change the way I believe. Right there it is. King James Bible. I'm giving you God's standard. Look up the verses for yourself. Make sure I'm not lying to you. You see how that works? I'm not some hate-filled preacher that's here screaming and yelling and saying more of you should be killed and stuff like this. I mean, I guess according to these false prophets out there, a Muslim terrorist was God's instrument of justice or something. It's absurd. It's absurd. But let's continue. Jump down to verse 14 and 15. Here in the same passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, 
because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Um, it doesn't say that Jesus died for all except sodomites. Jesus died for all except for transgender people. It says for all. Jesus Christ died for you. If you are transgender, if you are uh, into sodomy, as the Bible calls it, homosexuality is what the modern day term would be, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, whatever, whatever you want to classify yourself, God wants you to have that distinction. If God made you to be a man or made you to be a woman, then you be that. Okay? I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in the, you know, as we continue here. I'm getting ahead of myself. But you see there it says, that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. When you get saved, you don't live for yourself. Your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. God sent his son to die on the cross. That was a great price that he paid for your sins. So you don't continue in those sins after you get saved. Things change. Look at verse 17. This is the one I quoted earlier. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's an amazing thing. You read about story after story after story of people that get saved in the New Testament and how their lives dramatically change. Absolutely a, a wonderful promise. Verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what I'm doing right now. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It's a beautiful thing. Imputation means putting something on your own account that somebody else owes. All right? Here's how it works. You come to God as a transgendered person and, uh, or sodomy or whatever else, uh, sex perversion according to what the Bible teaches. You come to God and you say, I'm sorry. I, I, I need to be saved. And what God does is he takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his perfect sinless life, and he puts it on your account. He imputes it to you. And he takes all your sins, all those wicked secrets that, that you've done, all the thoughts that you've had, all the evil, and he puts it right onto Jesus Christ as he's dying on the cross. And God says, paid in full, your sins are taken away. Wiped clean, just like that, at the moment of salvation. It's an amazing thing. Verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Imputation. It's not... You have to continually live a life of sinless service and if you die in the state of grace or something like Catholicism teaches, uh, then you might make it to heaven if you go and burn in, a, for, in purgatory for a while. No, no, no. You aren't even going to find that teaching in Scripture. It's, it's absurd. <laughs> okay. Um, what you do for salvation is you come to God as a sinner and then you put your faith in Him and God will look at you and He'll say, are you being sincere or something here? Are you mocking or whatever else? And if you're sincerely there for salvation, God will impute His righteousness and He'll take all the sins, all the secrets of your past, those wicked things you don't want found out, He'll take them and He'll put them on the cross there. He'll put them on Jesus Christ. He pays for them at the cross and they don't come up at the judgment. Every knee shall bow, by the way. Everybody's going to be judged. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You say, well, I just don't know what to think about this. This is, this is stuff I've not heard before. Uh, you mean to tell me I don't have to go to church to be saved? Absolutely not. You mean to tell me I don't have to dress in my Sunday best and things? Absolutely not. No. I don't have to become a Baptist? Oh, please don't. <laughs> uh, I don't have to become a Catholic? Again, no. <laughs> uh, no, you have to come to Jesus Christ for a personal relationship with Him. You say, when should you do it? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Don't consider this just a vain thing and you just go, well, you know, yeah, I've heard this stuff before. God's grace is here for you right now. You can get saved. Verse 2. 
For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Secured is another way of saying helped. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Go to my main channel page. I have a video about our, a salvation message, and it shows all the scriptures. takes you through the New Testament, shows you the scriptures, what you need to do to be saved. I'd recommend watching that. Now's the day of salvation. All right. Next, let's go back to Leviticus. You say, what about this thing of God killing the, the uh, Sodomites in the Old Testament? Well, we're going to see about that. Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus 18, verse 22. That's where we're going to start. It says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. You're not going to find anywhere in the New Testament or the Old Testament where it says that sodomy is okay, God's all right with it, whatever else. They can't get that from the pages of this King James Bible. They have to change it. They have to go appeal to Greek or Hebrew or whatever else. And they'll tell you that, uh, well, you know, the Greek word should be better translated as. What they don't tell you is the lexicons that they're using will have multiple definitions for one Greek word. Okay, give you a good example in the English language. What about the word post? How many definitions for the word post are there? We have a mailbox post. You have you can post a note on a thing. A soldier has to keep his post. You know, see, there's a lot of different meanings of the word post. So what these people do is they'll go to you know Greek or Hebrew lexicons, and oftentimes they're not even written by saved people. And they'll go in there and they'll look at multiple definitions for what this word could mean, and they'll pick the one to fit their doctrine. They won't go with the plain English of this book, this King James Bible. But let's continue. Verse 23. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Passing laws to legalize that too, by the way. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgment, judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled that the land spew not you out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among the, their people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. God's attitude towards the abomination of sodomy, of this perversion, his attitude's never changed. God has never gotten to a point where he says, well, you know, okay, I guess it's all right. You know, well, you know, I, my mind's changed on, changed on it. You're not going to find that teaching in here. So when you read about these things in the Old Testament where God was telling the Jews to just go in and just slaughter the people, it was because of this sex perversion, these issues there. That's God's feelings on the matter. Now in the New Testament, you read that such were some of you, but they got saved. Their lives changed. But don't think for one second that you can become a Christian and continue in your wickedness. Continue in that wicked lifestyle. You can't do it. You will not be able to do that. The Holy Spirit moves into your life. When you get saved, the Lord's going to get that wicked perversion out of your life. Just as simple as that. Finally, we're going to go to the book of Psalms. Psalm 139. I'll show you what the real issue is with the sodomy and transgender thing. More of the transgender than anything else. Psalm 139. Verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. This is the prayer of a saved man, too, by the way. Right? But this is something that you need to think about if you are involved in this perversion issue. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. 
Thou compassest me, my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand, thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain unto it. That's a proper respect for God, by the way. Don't think that you can figure out God's mind. He knows everything about you. He knows everywhere that you're going. He sees everything around you. He, he's there. That's why the Bible talks about the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him. They call upon His name, I think it says. Verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there doesn't mean God's burning in hell. It just simply means God knows everything that's going on. He sees everything that's going on. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me up, or shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Now look at verse 14. This is the big thing. This is the main reason, in my opinion, why transgenderism is wrong, why it's an abomination. It says here, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. You know what you're doing when you're a man and you dress like a woman? Or when you're a woman and you dress like a man, you know what you're doing? You are showing contempt for who God made. You're a woman and you have long, beautiful hair and you go and you cut it off. You want to have hair that looks like mine? You know what you're doing? You're causing confusion. You're showing God that you're not happy for the way He made you. You're a woman and you say, I'm going to put on men's clothing. I'm going to put on pants. Again, you know, oh, this is radical. This is... Where were women wearing pants a hundred years ago and on back through history. Why is it that only here in our modern times did women start wearing pants? Where did they get the pants from? Hmm? You go back to the beginning, they were getting them from men. There weren't any clothing stores that just all of a sudden said, let's start making pants for women. They were taking them from men. Buying men's clothing. Mm -hmm. And now you have situations where you see a couple going and you go, is that a sodomite couple? They look, both look the same. They both look like men. And you see them turn, oh, okay, now I think that's the woman there. I think. I'm not really sure. And I think that that might be the man. There's supposed to be distinction. Why? Because our text right there in verse 14 says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't be ashamed of who God made you to be. You say, well, I'm a woman and I don't really have... I'm not a beauty queen or anything else. Well, don't be. But I'll tell you what, you can take the most homely looking woman and get her hair long and put her in a nice modest dress. She'll be beautiful. Well, she's not going to be a supermodel or something like that, but why do you want to be an anemic supermodel anyhow? I mean, whatever. But the point is, God will give beauty when you do things His way. You know, I want to be a man. Why? Because that's who God made me to be. So I'm not going to shave off my beard. I'm going to let my beard grow. I'm going to have my hair short to distinguish my hair from my wife's hair. I'm not going to put on my wife's dresses. Okay, I'm odd enough as it is. You know, <laughs> I don't need that on top of it yet. You know, she wears dresses. I wear pants. She doesn't wear my clothing. I don't wear hers. There's distinction. When we go out in public, nobody's going to look and say, which one is the husband, which one is the wife? They know. They know. You say, well, you're just doing that because of your religious convictions. I'm doing it because of what the Bible says. I don't have any kind of a creed, any kind of membership that I'm part of, some conference or whatever else. I live by the book. And my Bible says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and God wants a distinction between men and women. That's the real issue with this whole trans transgender thing. It's a hatred of God. That's what's really going on. I'll grant you there are people that are confused. I'll grant you that. I know my wife has talked about this, you know, her growing up and everything else. She was forced into 
into boys' clothes and boys' activities and stuff, sports and things. She went into the military. You know, you look at her now in a video and you think, oh, she's some kind of conservative religious nut or something like this. For the majority of her life, she was a pants wearing, even had short hair for a while, you know. So, and she was very confused. There were times that she wished that she was a boy. She said, I wish I was, you know, born a boy instead of a girl. Yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of you are going through that out there. I don't hate you. I don't advocate some Muslim terrorist coming and murdering you and a whole bunch of others too. I don't advocate that. The New Testament does not advocate that. All right? Such were some of you. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You can change. You can have a new life in Christ Jesus. You can thank God for how he made you and say, you know what? I might not be the best looking guy. I might not be the prettiest girl. But you know what? I'm going to be what God made me to be. And I don't care what society says. And I'm going to tell you right now, you better get away from television because television will warp your mind. They have an agenda. And it is a satanic agenda to mess your mind up. Again, how did the pants revolution come in here in America with women? How did it come in? Movies. I remember the Andy Griffith show. I used to watch that thing. I don't anymore because it's so filled with uh, philosophies, feministic type of stuff and whatever else. But I remember they had an episode the one time and they were in Hollywood or something like this and they were like flipping out because they saw some woman with men's britches on. Well, that was back in the you know, early 1960s when that show came out. It was still kind of a new thing. Most women were still wearing dresses. But it changed. Women have been transgender for, like I said, years and years and years. They wear that which pertaineth unto a man. But now the men are starting to go and dress like women. And now it's like, oh, everybody's flipping out and everything else. Well, why didn't you flip out about the women? Some hypocrisy there. But uh, I just, my prayer for you out there, if you're into this movement, um, you're not going to find joy. You're not going to find peace in it. It's not going to happen. Uh, you can't find peace in perversion. It just isn't going to happen. And uh, those that are truly saved are never going to advocate uh, you being killed, you being murdered. Uh, when we talk about the terror of the Lord, uh, it's because you die in your sins, you're going to go to a place called hell. Right down, right down there, the Bible talks about it being in the heart of the earth. And uh, that's where you'll go. And then you'll someday come up with the great white throne judgment, and there you get cast in the lake of fire for all of eternity. All right, so that's what we're warning about. And you could be a liar and still be an abomination in God's sight. You see? And you say, and again, let me just say this. It's not that God's condemning you and, and saying, I'm just going to burn you forever. He's saying, no, all you got to do to be saved is be a sinner. Just admit to being a sinner. Come to me for salvation. Understand that you need to come here for salvation. You can't save yourself. You're not a good person. That's all it is. And God will give you that reset button that you can have a new life. Okay? So that is it. We're going to close this sermon with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would go out and, and uh, convict anybody that's watching this sermon that has been involved in these things and that wants a new life, that sees the pain and sees the loneliness and the frustration and, and uh, the dirty feelings and everything that accompany a life of perversion. And I pray, Lord, that they would listen to uh, your voice because you're calling them, Lord. I, I just pray that they would listen and take heed to what I've said and that they would get their salvation sorted out, that they would get it figured out what they need to do and that they would watch the salvation message or, or just read your word. Read the book of John and Romans, Lord, and, and sort it out for themselves. I just pray, Lord, though, that, that they would make it the main priority in their life. And, Lord, I do want to pray for your saints as well, those that are genuinely saved, that we would have a right attitude towards people that are involved in sex perversion and that we would not hate them and, and wish for their death. Uh, we're all worthy of death, Lord, and your word does not give any ground to execution of sodomites right now in the New Testament. We're not trying to build a nation, Lord, as, as it was in the Old Testament. I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to be able to witness to them with the proper spirit of, of uh, judgment for their sin, but yet at the same time love 
uh, to tell them that they can be saved, but they need to turn from that sin. And I just ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All righty. That is going to be it for that study. Um, the Bible does not give ground to executing people like this. And if you're watching this, uh, you can't condemn all Bible believers uh, simply because of what Stephen Anderson has done or his little buddy there or whatever else. You can't condemn us all based on what those guys have done. Um, we, they don't represent Bible-believing Christians. They're not even saved. They're, they're false, very, very wicked people. That's why they have so much hate in them. And I dare say, too, that uh, usually the ones that, that scream the loudest about this whole thing are the ones that are guilty of it themselves. It wouldn't surprise me at all if I found out that some of these guys, Stephen Anderson included, were actually sodomites on the side. Wouldn't shock me at all. So, that's going to be it. Don't really have anything else to say for now, so I've got some more videos to get done. So, uh, that'll be it. Thank you very much for your prayers. Everybody out there, thank you for those who donate to the ministry. We always appreciate that. Uh, we pray for your God's blessing to be upon you. And, uh, you know, I guess that's going to be it. So we'll see you in the next study.